Welcome. Shannon Duick uh, back with us this evening. We're really pleased to have her back with another session, this time titled The Dressage Journey, Important Things I've Learned About How to Sit and Ride Well. You will recall that Shannon Duick is a lifelong equestrian who moved to New England from Vancouver in 1997 to get closer to the dressage opportunities. She's represented Canada internationally at the Pan Am's WEG and the World Cup on self-trained horses and coaches internationally as well. She now resides in Loxahatchee, Florida, where she runs Duick Dressage Training and is lucky enough to count Carl Hester as one of her coaches. So before I mess anything else up, Shannon, I will pass it over to you. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you, thank you, Iris. Um, I'm so pleased to be back. And I, when I was asked to do this again, I really didn't know what to do um, because, okay, I did the leg and I did the rain aids and then what do you do? And then I thought, well, before you even do the leg and do the rain aids, you should probably learn how to sit. So this is should be the first PowerPoint that I ever did, but it turns out to be the third one. And I have to also give a huge thank you to Beth Bukema for doing this PowerPoint. It was not me who put this together because there is no time during season to sit for a Luddite and put a PowerPoint together. And Beth did it all. So I'm super happy that she was part of this whole project. Also, Beth takes lessons from me. So she was able to understand what I was going to try to say in the, in the presentation. So Beth is going to be advancing the slides. And um, so we just need a little bit of time sometimes to make sure that the slides are advanced correctly for you. One of the things I want to say is I'm going to give you a time to ask questions on a particular point. And I really appreciate the questions so that I can try to explain what I'm going to be saying to you. The point of the whole presentation is, um, you know, I read all the books. My mom was a dressage rider and a, up to the FBI levels when I was a kid. And I was an event rider who couldn't sit the trot. But I read all the books. I knew all the theory. And what I have found over time is that there's a lot of things in those books and in that theory that doesn't necessarily translate into top riding. So I've learned by feel some of the finer points, and I'm going to try to make these finer points open to you through the presentation. Um, one of the things, so this is, oh, I just have to show off my little mare. This is uh, Angelica. This photo was taken by Sue Stickle last weekend at Atacon. She's not even seven until next year, next month. And she's doing the pre-St. George in the big ring and the CDIs looking like that. So I just, this is my little hard horse and we bred her. But anyway, thanks Sue for the beautiful picture. Now, uh, next slide, Beth, please. So what I would really like you to take away from today's presentation is that sitting properly comes from your pelvis. It comes from your center. And I know you've all been told that the center of gravity is down there somewhere below your belly button. Yeah, it really is. But it's the whole pelvis that allows you to balance over your horse, that allows your spine to be one with a horse's spine. Once your pelvis is balanced, you are then you must be able to move equally with the horse. So this is kind of interesting, the whole spine, how it moves is kind of like a ripple that we need to absorb in a vertical way. There's always some forward and back, but the vertical allows you to balance. If your pelvis and spine can be balanced correctly, your leg position automatically becomes more correct. It absolutely allows for a correct leg position. If your pelvis is not balanced, you're gonna be working so hard to make your leg be correct. So again, we come back to that idea that the pelvis is where it all starts, whether it's laterally or longitudinally. If your pelvis is correct, then I'm gonna bring in a concept of what we call the pelvo, which I, this, I did not coin this term, it's total plagiarism, but the pelvo is 
crucial to correct connection. And the pelvo is the connection of the rider's pelvis and the rider's elbow, that they stay together. The elbow is part of the rider. And then I like to think that the forearm and the wrist and the hand is part of the horse's mouth and neck. And that's where the connection arrives. Then I'm gonna talk, so once we have the pelbow, you're gonna be able to get a correct arm and hand position. The correct arm and hand position allows you to have a correct and kind of a comforting connection to your horse's mouth instead of a restricting connection to your horse's mouth. So now if you can have all of those things happen, you're, you will be able to be synchronized with the movement of your horse. And the following movement that you can follow the movement of the horse is first and foremost, before you even try to effect it, that we are able to follow what the horse does without losing our balance and without grabbing on with the leg or grabbing on with the hand because we stay balanced. When you can follow the horse correctly, you can start to affect the horse. And then you can affect the horse with positive influences instead of negative influences. And this is kind of where my other two PowerPoint presentations where I was talking about using your leg and using your hand, this is where this should come into the effectiveness of the rider. But it all starts with all the beginning. And I think, well, for me anyway, because I had to learn how to ride and how to sit the trot and how to do all this stuff, all that theory didn't necessarily translate into how I was actually riding and how the feel is. So I'm gonna try with this presentation to teach the feel of how we do this. All right, so that's my goal anyway, with the presentation. Okay, so next slide, Beth. What do we have? We have next. All right, okay, so here we have one of our icons of American dressage. This is Adrian Lyle and Salvino. What you can see here, okay, first of all, we see a beautiful vertical position. You see that her balance, shoulder, hip, and heel is pretty damn correct. Her heels are down, her weight is down in her legs. There is an almost straight line from elbow to hand to the snaffle bit. It's correct. It looks supple. But one of my biggest takeaways in this presentation, the beginning of the presentation, is how the lower back and the SI works. So what I, you know, look at everything, it's beautiful, of course, and the horse is fantastic and it's fantastic because Adrian Lyle rides like this. But look at her lower back. I don't know about you guys, but I was always taught that we had to do a pelvic tilt. And yes, we do actually have to have our pelvis moving, but I didn't know it was that, that the pelvic tilt went like that. But look at her lower back. There is a definite arch in her lower back. And what I was under the impression through some of the books and some of the teaching was that I was supposed to tuck my butt under on the horse, which is not what she's doing there. And I have a whole bunch more pictures of our top riders so that you will actually believe me that you do not tuck your butt under and you don't squeeze your buttocks and you don't use your glutes to do this, to ride a horse correctly. It's about allowing your glutes to go around the horse and being able to use all those internal muscles around the pelvis to be able to influence the horse positively in a forward and upward way. So we might come back to this slide so that you can take a look, but just right now, take another look at her lower back because it's really, really, really important. Okay, next slide. So correct alignment. Um, this is from Anthony Crossley's book. Okay, this actually, there's a lot of things that are really good about this, but it's not perfect for me. Um, what is really good, you see how he points that arrow downward to allow a little bit more spinal flexion in the lower back. This is where you're going to be absorbing your horse's movement. And it's by allowing that flexion. And the spine, as you can see, it's like an S curve or a double S curve, and it has to be able to ripple to allow your, you to follow the movement, that up and down movement of your horse's back. 
there is a forward action in your hip bone. So if the hip bones are here, I don't know, you can't really see, I can't do a cursor here, but at the front of his pelvis, those are your hip bones, right? Those hip bones have to be able to move forward. It's, it's below your belly button and it's a little pooch out with your belly below your belly button that you can allow to happen to allow your pelvis to rock in a forward way. It's not downward. It's not driving down in the horse's back. If you were to, if you were to tilt your seat bone underneath you, you will usually be pushing down on the horse's back. And that is absolutely not what we want the horse to do. We want the horse's back to come up to us instead of get driven down to us. We would like to see this rocking happen on a stride to stride basis. Like the horse moves every stride and his back moves every stride. So we have to be able to move the pelvis like this every stride. It's like riding a wave that you do. And eventually you can actually start to influence the amplitude of the wave with your seat. That's when we can start to make second trots and bigger canters and all of that stuff instead of just going forward and flat. We start to be able to really influence collection when you can ride the wave with your, with your lower back. Big thing, big point at the bottom there, buttocks open and low. No squeezing of the buttocks. We, I, I, whenever I teach somebody, you've got to bring the leg back because it's very common that the lower leg, the leg comes forward and you close this hip joint instead of open it. Um, that and they squeeze their bum right out of the saddle. It never, like seriously, you're never gonna have a bubble butt from riding because there is no glutes involved. There is no glutes. They, of course, there's a little bit, but there's it can't be an important part of how you ride your horse. The glutes have to allow you to sit around the horse and scoop the horse up instead of squeeze the horse down. The lower spine, Okay, I'm sitting on a heat, heat, heat pad right now because my lower spine is killing me. I don't know what I did. It never hurts, but it hurts right now. But your lower spine, that tailbone and the, and the lumbar has to be able to allow your pelvis to move. So lower spine and your hip joint are the most important things about how to sit correctly and how to be able to afford, how to, to be able to follow your horse's movement. Okay, so now this is a whole other topic that maybe you can do for Nita, saddle balance. If your saddle is not balanced, it, you're working against it. I mean, I can ride most saddles. I don't, even if they're yucky, I can ride them, but I know instantly if they're not balanced correctly for me. And for sure, I know instantly because my neck hurts in the sitting trot. But I know when I sit on it, you're like, oh my God. And I have rarely ever had a saddle that is too high up behind. I'm sure it happens, but it's rare. Almost always saddles are too low behind and they don't sit you up where you need to be vertically. So I would, I would say, unless I have a horse that's really built downhill, most saddles do not sit the rider up over the horse in a correct balance. Um, so... I mean, like I said, it's a whole different topic. I can't go into it. But if you're really having trouble with this, look at your saddle balance because you might be really fighting against equipment that's not helping you in that. All right. Um, okay. So now uh, here's actually a pretty good GIF on showing the how the pelvis rocks. And I just want you to watch it a little bit because you can see he – He's not digging down, he's sliding, he or she, sliding the pelvis forward in the saddle in a forward motion, not a downward motion, in a forward motion. And when he, the engagement happens, which is when the green arrow happens, you can see the bend in his lower back or her lower back gets more, not less. That's where I see people doing things wrong where they think that they're gonna slide forward in the saddle by tucking their butt underneath them instead of letting their pelvis push forward and up over the pommel. So again, it's like trying to find the wave in your, it's here, I'm gonna to try to get in front of my camera, trying to find that wave that comes up over the saddle 
that you're able to just follow the wave and then impact the wave of the horse. Um, and you're certainly well, I mean, we're going to record this so you can look at that GIF again a few times. And, and if you watch it a few times, you will get to see what you have to do. One of the biggest exercises that I do, and I do it every morning because like I'm getting old, right? So I, it's not like I wake up limber anymore. But if any of you do yoga, sun salutation, where you open yourself up and your hips go forward, you open the front of your hips joints way open and stretch yourself. That's the same motion that you need to do on the horse without doing this whole thing, of course. But the hip, if you do the sun salutation, the hips are doing what you need to be doing with your with your horse when you're riding, whether it's walk, trot, or canter. Okay. So here we have, so now we get to enjoy some really good riding pictures. This is Carl Hester, as you all know. This is on Vogue, his current top horse. Carl is showing you how to engage the lower back and the pelvis in the PF. So it's a little more exaggerated than what you will see, because what he's doing is saying, you're going to step forward and you're not going to step forward. You're going to step forward and you're not going to step forward. That's what a PF is, right? So, but you can see how much that lower back gets arched in it instead of rounded. So this is like the big thing that they don't always say in books and it's hard to find. We were looking for images. Beth and I were looking for images and it was hard to find them in textbooks. It is not hard to find them with top riders. You look at pictures of top riders and you see it all the time. In textbooks, difficult to find. So this is, this is one of those you know, sticking points where you're like, yeah, they don't really teach that in the textbook, but that's how you ride them. And if you, I don't know if you can, oh, well, you don't have to go back to Adrian, I guess, because we have more pictures of top riders with the engagement of the seat bones like that and the pelvis like that. If you can ride like that, you will be enhancing your horse's free flowing movement. And you know that, you know, even an intro and first level and training level, it's all about going freely forward. It's still the same at Grand Prix. It's just with more collection and more control. It's still freely forward. So as you get the horse more contained and stronger in the collection and stronger in the impulsion, this has to maintain that you're not taking the horse back into this stuff, that you're riding them forward into this stuff. So this forward ripple in the small of your back, this the ability of the spine to absorb like that, that's super important. Your SI has to be loose. And if your SI is not loose, you cannot impact that horse's, you can't follow it and you can't impact it. So anything that you can do therapy wise, like my heating pad right now, helps you ride. Supple hips. And that means that you can open your hip joint. So all sorts of stretches can help you open your hip joint. And nobody who's an amateur can come out after a day at a desk and be open and supple in their SI and their hip joints. You have to stretch and you have to get movement happening. We all warm up our horses. We need to warm yourself, the rider up as well and get things moving and get things open. Like I said, I'm a professional. I ride a lot of horses a day, but my first horse, I'm always stretching before the first horse, always. And I try to make sure that the first horse isn't nuts so that I you know, can drop my stirrups and stretch myself out before I put myself together. Again, soft eyes are crucial. Staring at your horse. Okay, so Beth put in this, first of all, her first thing was look up. It's not look up, it's be soft in your eyes. You can't stare at anything. You need to be aware of everything and not stare at anything because if you're staring, you're locking yourself down. So that whole idea of being aware of your circumstances and the arena and you will be able to feel what you're doing. But if you stare at your horse's mouth, the only thing you're looking at is the right side of his jaw and you're not feeling what's going on in the back and in your back either. Uh, this is a good one, loose adductors. The muscles on the inside of your legs, we, um, if you're not balanced, you'll be gripping. There's, I mean, you have to, how do you stay on your horse? If you're not balanced, you have to stay on your horse somehow. So you grip with your legs and that if you can figure out how to balance your pelvis so that you feel safe 
you know you're going to stay on your horse without your legs. You can loosen your adductors and your horse will be able to move forward with it. So we need loose thighs on the horse to allow him to go forward. It's a very natural reaction. Like if I'm breaking a three-year-old, horses stop as soon as you close your, close your thighs on them. That's a natural. You stop them. So if you're gripping with your thighs, that horse will stop. And then you're kicking it because it doesn't go forward. It's not fair. Loosen your thighs. But it only you can only loosen your thighs if your pelvis is balanced on the horse. So <clears throat> anyway, those are, oh, okay. So now we get to watch fun stuff. Carl, my fave. This is slow motion. And <clears throat> we're going to loop it a couple times so you can watch it. Because you can only look at one thing at once. Slow motion flying changes. He does two tempies. This is Utopia at the London Olympics. The first time you watch this, it would be nice if you just watch how his back moves with the horse and just watch it. But you can see that his SI and his back arches with each forward move of the horse. So he's not holding back. He's pushing the horse up and forward with his pelvis every single stride, right? Look at his lower back. It pushes up and forward. Then he drops down and up and forward. And then he drops down, he drops down. He doesn't push down, he drops down. There's a difference between them. And he pushes up and forward and he drops down. So there is no downward push. There is only an upward pull and a downward relaxation on the horse. So it, <clears throat> now when we watch the two tempies, okay, so flying changes are often a big bug for people because you start to throw yourself around in them. And I totally understand, believe me, like everything that I know that's wrong, I've done it. So that's why I know it's wrong and I know it doesn't work. But watch him through the flying change. He leans back and pushes his hip forward. And then he leans back and he pushes the horse forward to his hand. And he sits and he pushes the horse forward to his hand. I mean, really, it's beautiful, even in slow motion. So straight, so supple. Legs, his legs are underneath him, not forward. Look, even in here, the change to the right, his right leg is nowhere near the girth, nowhere near the girth. It is on the fat part of that horse's barrel. I see way too many people with their inside legs somewhere up near the girth notch and then wondering why their horse's shoulder goes out. But it's because their leg is pushing the shoulder out instead of their leg keeping the barrel of the horse. His legs never go near the shoulder of the horse. And one more. And oh, the other thing that I love about that is that his eyes stay looking forward. They're soft. He's not staring at the letter. He still has to be feeling, right? Do we want to see that again? Or was that enough? Everybody, you do? Don, you want to see it again? Does the red, I can't hear you. So I'm just like, you're nodding. So I'm thinking. I, mean, I, don't, I don't really have a, a way to ask everyone else, but I'm, I'm going okay. to watch it again. <laughs> okay. Let's watch it again then. Cause it's really quite amazing. We're getting yeses in the chat now. So. Okay, good. So Validate. let's watch Carl again. Okay, now next thing I want you to look at is his lateral balance. Look at how tall his spine is and look at how even his shoulders are in that. I mean, there's so many things to watch. I and mean, if you, you can find this YouTube video and watch it 10 times in a row and look at something else each time. This time, again, watch the lower back to begin with. And then you can look at what his hands do or don't do. They are pretty damn stationary through the whole thing. 
sometimes his hands go forward with the horse when he wants the horse to go forward. Like there, his hands are quite forward, right? And then you'll see sometimes that his hands stay a bit more stationary. So his pelvis pushes to his hand and the hand says, wait a little. And then the hand goes, there's a little wait right there. <laughs> and then the hand says, I'm allowing you to move again. And then the hand maybe says, wait right there. It said, wait, the inside ring said, wait. And then it allows him to move. The hand says, wait right there. And the hand just said, wait, wait, around that corner because he needed a little bit of bend and a little bit of inside balancing. But all of that waiting that he can do is without ever pulling back. It's just pushing the pelvis forward in the wave and then he just retards the wave a tiny bit with the hand in the back. He doesn't pull back in it. Now, while you're watching this now, next thing I want, you, we've got time. So take a look at what, is, how, what his hand position is. We're gonna get to this later on in the presentation, but look at his hand position. His thumbs, he's not rigidly up here with his thumbs. They're like that. Big thing, that's a big thing that's different in the books from how actually you ride. Yeah, super nice. Okay, look at his legs again, one more time. Look at where they are, he's gonna change. And his right leg now, it's left lead canter, his right leg is a little farther back. Now watch the right lead canter, it doesn't come up to the girth. It just stays centered. There you go, that's how you keep horses straight, is by not putting your leg up there at the girth and pushing their shoulder over which we are erroneously told to do. All right, there's Carl. We'll come back to Carl because he's really good. But let's go on to the next one. Yeah, like he's pretty good. A couple of questions when you get to a- Oh, get to okay, let's, let's stop and do questions. I'm really happy to do a few questions at the end of each okay. segment. So uh, firstly, um, we have a number of members who are horrified at the thought of watching themselves in slow motions. Didn't know that was an option. So that, yeah. that is not happening. <laughs> not okay. on our, top of our list. Um, Wilhelm, uh, is it Musler's book? Uh, Riding Logic. Chapter one seems to complement what you're saying about rider position. Are you familiar with that one? Um, is that something you'd agree with? Yes. Perfect. But I am familiar. I definitely read it. I definitely <laughs> read it. So and like I said, I did. we did find these in books, but it's often not clear. I saw, we saw a lot of spinal pictures that didn't show it correctly. So we, uh, Beth and I both went through a bunch and went, no, no, no. And then went, okay, that's good. Fascinating. And yeah. then uh, another question just about, there's a lot of uh, talk about the, the muscle tone in the pelvic floor um, mm -hmm. and, and having that, how does that, uh, how, how, how does that you, happen? How do you have okay. the one and not the, not the glutes take over? How, right. How do I, I, I don't know. Well, okay. Full, full confession here. I've never had kids. So I can't speak to that, but it's not my pelvic floor that I think about when I'm doing this. It is all of the internal muscles around your pelvis. So pelvic floor, I'm sure is part of it. That, that, you know, and, and for sure, like the Kegel exercises and stuff like that can only help getting you stronger in that. But I, it is so much internal around the pelvis that allows you to go with your pelvis up with the horse and meet it exactly. And you have to be strong. There is no way that you can do this without being strong. And it, then it's, then it, the problem becomes if you're too strong, you can become rigid. So it's being able to be strong within the movement that you want, that we're trying to get done. Um, also, I see I have one student who is a personal trainer and she is, oh my God, fit, crazy fit. She's a little too strong in her front and not strong enough in her back so that they don't complement themselves 
all the time. She's getting much stronger in her back so that she can let the front and the back work together. And it, so too many crunches are not your friend. Well, that's really, truly, there's a, there's, there is a thing. If you do too many crunches, you end up being crunched over with these really strong contracted abs. And that's not what we want. Okay. So we have to, we have to have the strength more in extension rather than contraction. I hope that helps. Yes, it does. So I'm getting a, a bunch of chat is exploding. Um, oh, okay. We've got uh, some questions about uh, around recommended exercises for each of your points. I don't know if that's easier to, to address at the end um, or kind of as we go. Okay. There's so many exercises and we could do another thing about the exercises, but you can do so many things off your horse that help you. And one of my, one of my favorites is to put your hands on a board somewhere that's about height when you're standing and with your hands on that board so that they can't move you have to learn how to move your pelvis into it without letting your hands do this or do that or do this or do that and your shoulders can't move around and you're you know it's like learning how to push your pelvis into your hand instead of you, we have to separate the pelvis and the hand we have to separate the legs and the pelvis that allows you to do that but there like i said there are so many exercises i could do two hours on that and I'm willing to later if you want to. And Beth, Beth, I may do those exercises. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, um, yeah we'll, we'll mention too, we had, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with this stable for riders. We had Kristen Gray uh, on and she's got a recording on our site too for anyone interested in that. Oh. I don't. <laughs> okay, good, Sorry. we're okay with that. Um, the other thing that I think is really great, there's physiotherapists that are coming out right now that are doing taping and they tape you from front and back. And what you have to learn how to do is keep your tapes extended and equal. So that when you ride, you, if you collapse like this, the tapes become floppy and you have to learn how to keep them strong and every stride try to keep the tension in the tapes. Also, you know, side to side, if you collapse one side, that side gets all floppy. So doing the taping with these physiotherapists that are equine you know, for people, for riders, fabulous, absolutely fabulous for learning how to do this stuff. I highly recommend that stuff. Okay. okay. Yeah, we've got a lot of, lot of comments in the chat about um, ways to check out the, the top riders. You can see the, the stains on their uh, britches, like how high up it goes on their, on their leg, the, how deep right. into the saddle they're sitting. They're sitting all the time. That's and good. Another question um, around the going too far, how, um, what physically, if you're, if you're not uh, as in tune with your uh, body as other people might be, how do you know sloshing versus driving versus the, the, the movement that you're talking about? Is it that downward motion? Is that your guardrail or? I, I don't want sloshing and I don't want driving. And how do you, I want, I want, I want you to surf a wave. So <laughs> To tell that you've crossed the line into dangerous, it's the push down is what you're looking for. There's push down is like, it, it, there is no push down. Don't push down, follow down okay. and pick up. Like it really, it is about being able to ride the wave up and eventually like the passage, right? That's one of the biggest things, but developing the trot, developing the canter just to develop amplitude. It comes from up, not from down. Okay. All right. I think we've gotten all the, all the questions so far. I'll keep an eye on it. All right. Good. Okay. So now we talked about what was perfect. Now we're going to talk about what's not perfect and where we're all coming from because nobody's perfect. Carl didn't learn, how, wasn't born learning how to ride like that, right? This is where people, a lot of people come to from, if they're coming from like the hunter jumper world, mm. where they have this overly arched back and the arch in the back is in the wrong place. It's above your pelvis where you arch and you stick out your sternum and you're like, okay, here's my boobs, right? Wrong. That's not what you want. You do want a tall sternum, but not because you've arched it out like this. Tall is different than arching. The arch that you have to allow is lower down. So when you're arched like this, you're not able to surf the wave forward and up either. You're just like pressing down onto the withers with your, from your mid back 
upwards. You're pressing down onto the withers. You're dampening everything down with the horse. Your contact, your seat bones are not sliding forward in the saddle every stride. They're just pounding down like this on the horse. Um, there's weight, you'll feel it. There's way too much weight on your on the crotch part. It, it, to sit really well, you've got three points. You've got your pubic bone and the two seat bones that move along with the horse. This, you won't feel the seat bones being able to stay along with the horse's lower back. And with that, your influence, again, dampens the front end down instead of encourages the horse to come up and forward in front of you. That's okay, so wait for a second on the arched. This is where I commonly see people coming from the hunter jumper world into dressage that we have to try and take some of that arch out and to try and get a little more suppleness happening so that the spine can move like ripple instead of just stay there like this as you go. Then what I commonly see, the next step that I see is this, which is the next slide, Beth, the rounded spine. People, and this is... I know this really well, because this is what I thought, this is how I thought you sat the trot for the longest time. And I know that there was books who made me think that, and I don't, I can't, I'm not gonna diss anything, but I know there's books who made me think that, where you say, okay, now I'm gonna do a pelvic tilt, and I'm gonna crush those butts, that my butt under, and I'm gonna, you know, pretend I'm on the toilet. Wrong, it's wrong. This impedes the horse as much as the other one. You're driving the horse down, you're behind the motion, and you're not going with. So, wrong. Do not round your back and collapse your middle like that. I will allow people to lean back in their, in their evolution of riding. I'll allow them to lean back, but they can't do it with their pelvis tilted like that. If they lean back, they have to do it with too much arch in their back so that their pelvis learns how to go forward while their back is you know, a little bit behind the horse. And once their pelvis learns how to move forward, then they can bring their sternum and their rib cage back up on top of the horse. So I don't mind leaning back as a place on the journey. I do mind that rounded lower back like that. Buttocks should not be tucked under and tight, ever. You will stop your horse. Your spine cannot, your spine just pushes the horse down. It's like you'll make your horse back sore and not wanting to go forward. Almost always with this, you also find somebody who's pulling with the reins. You're pushing so hard to try to make that horse go forward and then you're pulling with the reins at the same time and the horse goes, I, I can't do it. So, no, we don't, I mean, yeah, leaning back, sometimes okay. Not with the buttocks pushed under like that, not never okay. But it's a, it's a common place that people go to while they're trying to correct number one, which is the overly arched back. So we wanna find that exact place where you can just allow yourself to, to move along in balance with the horse. When you lean back to, we often see um, a chair seat where the hip joint stays closed and the legs are gripping on because you're not quite balanced over the horse. And then that doesn't, that also impedes if your legs are gripping, that stops a horse. It doesn't make a horse go. We think it does, right? We all say more leg. Wrong. More effective leg, better balance, all those things are right, but more leg is not the right words. And we use that. I use that. I'm just as guilty as anybody else. It's not more leg, it's a better leg. Be have a better leg, not a more leg. All right. Any more questions while we go off of that? This is all this is all about looking at the balance and the rider from the side. Now we're gonna go looking at the balance and the rider from the back. The horse. Lateral postural imbalances, you can see from the pictures on the right, what happens. Nobody is perfect. We're all, you know, we're all working. If all of those top riders that I'm gonna show you pictures of, they're working all the time with their, with their posture and their seat. They're not like, it's not like they were born that gifted. We all work at it. Um, 
Catherine Bateson just had the taping guy come to her. I mean, she's weird at the world championships. She just had the taping guy come to her and she was like, oh, wow, my right leg doesn't do what I want it to do. So <laughs> there you go. We're all working on it all the time. Uh, people are crooked from the back. We walk crookedly. If I'm given my druthers and don't think about it, because I've done a lot of running and triathlons and all that, I will drift left all the time. So I work on it. I work on it when I'm sleeping. I work on it when I'm sitting watching a movie. I work on how my balance is. Um, okay, we look at this. It, again, it all comes from your pelvis. Now, there are some people that have like legitimate scoliosis and things like that. I totally get that. You can still work with it and work to get better. But for the rest of us, we have mild asymmetries. But look at the pelvis. It's not level. Don't try to fix these things like when your shoulder drops this way or your shoulder drops that way and you collapse. We're not going to fix it by fixing your shoulders. We're going to fix it by making your pelvis level instead of your shoulders. If your pelvis is level and balanced, your legs can drop level and you can stack your torso on top of it level. So when you're when we have this, and every one of you has it, I have it, everybody has it. We all have to work on it. You have to identify it and work on it. We're, what we end up doing is we're pushing a horse one way or the other with our posture. And then your reins and your legs are saying, don't go there because I don't want you to go there. One way you'll find really easy and the other way you won't because of these postural imbalances. Um. Can you, uh, that, so all these, this is all true, the muscles and blah, 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 that's all re really true. But I, the biggest thing I want you to look at is the spine. And when you look at the spine pictures, look at the difference between collapsed and square. And the pelvis is where it starts. All right, next picture, Beth, please. Yeah, oh, leg scripping. Okay, this is really cool. No, yeah, leg scripping is the is a cause of imbalance. Now it's, well, that's maybe not right. Imbalance is a cause of legs gripping. Say it the other way around. If you're balanced, your legs can equally drop. You will feel like you don't have to hold yourself on because you're balanced over your horse. At least in neutral, right? I mean, obviously, if the horse jumps one side or the other, your legs are going to grip because you need some help. But in neutral, when things are good, your legs will not grip if you are in balance. It's when you feel it's human. It's well, it's, of course, it's human. If you feel like you're going to fall off one side or the other, you have to grip with a leg to keep yourself on. So when we work on getting the pelvis there, you can let go with your legs. If you can let go with your legs, I guarantee you, your horses are going to be more forward. Okay, next one. Okay, so this picture I got last weekend at the CDI and a friend of mine just took it from the A, like they were just there and they took the picture and I went, well, that's actually a pretty good picture. So, because uh, like I said, oftentimes my left shoulder is dropped, not there. I'm pretty damn square. We're really proud of this. Um, my right stirrup, if you look at it really closely, shoulders are square. I'm square up to my waist where the belt is on the shad belly. Then if you look, my right leg is a little bit longer and my right hip is a little bit dropped. But if you look, the horse is trotting and the right hind is coming up and under and her, the right side of her back is down while, that comes, while the hind leg comes up and under. It's not my shoulder that's following that, it's my hip that's following that. That's legit. Not that I, you know, it wouldn't be legit if I did this to follow it. I'm square and letting the hips follow the horse's back as it drops rhythmically in the trot. So this is what we're actually trying to get done. My head slightly tipped left. I could be straighter. Maybe I was looking at the judge over there now and saying hi, but I don't know. Anyway, that's what we're trying to get done. And then your hips are moving with the horse's back, but not your shoulders so that you're not doing this and I'm balancing your horse while you're going. So, these lateral imbalances, I want you to think about fixing them from, again, your pelvis, not thinking about fixing them from your shoulders. 
if your pelvis is la is level, everything else can be, then it's possible. If your pelvis is not level, you're just going to end up in a wad of tension if you try to fix your shoulders or your legs. Um, one of the things I try to remember when you're going through any of the work is your right seat bone on the right side of the horse. And is your left seat bone on the left side of the horse? Or have you shifted your pelvis over here and then this happens to it? If that happens, you have to, act, if you're like this slid off over here, you have to actually physically make your pelvis go up and square. Even if you're going in a half pass that way, you have to say up and square and go again. So I like, I will lift myself off a saddle. If I've got a horse that slides me off one side or the other, I will lift myself off the saddle and sit again square and then continue with it. So that's the first step. Saddle balance, here we come back to that nasty saddle balance. If your saddle slips off to one side or the other, it's not helping you. Really, it's not helping you. And it's, you're working against against all the physics of a bad saddle. If your saddle's not square, you need to get a different saddle if you want to do this. And that's a really, and that's really hard. It is like the, it's trying to find the road to Oz, finding the right saddle, but it's worth trying to get the saddle that helps you do it. If your pelvis is equal, your legs can drop equally on the horse. If you make a spur mark on your horse on one side all the time, that's the side you're gripping on. You're not dropping that leg. So you won't make spur marks on your horse if your legs can drop equally, because then you won't be using your legs to grip at all. Your torso, once your pelvis is equal and level, your torso can stack on top of it. So it won't be sliding over here or sliding over there. And your shoulders can drop equally down instead of your left shoulder dropping more, your right shoulder dropping more, your shoulders can drop equally down around the horse. And then if that's level, then you can ride the wave forward and straight. All right, so this, it, it all starts with the pelvis. Any questions now, because we're going onward. I do have, uh, we've got a, a question just around uh, your recommendation for addressing uh, lateral balance when your horse actually carries one of his hips higher than the other when there's an imbalance there. Yeah, I, oh, well, that's hard. Um, with good dressage training, we should be able to impact their imbalances too, because no horses are, are equal either, right? This is absolutely true. Um, so with good dressage training, we should be able to impact how they use their bodies. Your saddle still needs to try to help you. And there might be shimming possibilities to help your saddle stay straight while when your horse is developing and then you can take a shim out or something like that as the horse gets better and better and better. Um, yeah, that's our job is to stay as square as possible while we're developing the horse equally supple and equally straight on either side. Not easy not easy <laughs> if it was we'd all be charlotte and winning gold medals um all right so now we're going to talk about the leg position because and this all comes from the pelvis how many of you were told that your knees and your toes had to be straight on a horse oh, i was a lot of people come to me with their knees and toes straight forward and frozen on their horse and they can't use their leg. And you're like, well, you, you, that's totally ineffective because your leg is frozen straight. Horses are wide, like a barrel. Your hips aren't that wide. So you have to somehow be able to go around your horse that's round. Now, if you're a long-legged rider on a slab-sided horse, you can be very often quite straight and parallel with your legs. If you are a petite rider with narrow hips on a wide horse, it's impossible to do. It is impossible. And if you try to do it, you will be gripping with your knees and gripping with your thighs as you're trying to do this. Where we, what we want is that your hip joint is loose enough that you can drape your leg around a horse. 
equally. If your pelvis is level, you can do that. Now with a wider horse, if you look at the first one, the one on the left, the knee and the toe are out, not straight ahead. Now this is what I see, the one on the right is what I see all the time because the rider cannot make his knee straight because the horse is wide. And then they go, well, my toe should be straight forward. So they've got the toe angle straight and the, there is so much tension in that leg to try just to keep a position that it impacts all of your effectiveness. So the toe and the knee needs to be exactly the same. And the toe and the knee need to be what it needs to be. Whatever your confirmation is and whatever your horse's confirmation is, your toe and your knee have to be what it needs to be to be able to drape around a horse's barrel. Um, the hip joint, mobility in your hip joint is super important where you can move your knee, like try, I do plies, so that my knee and toe can, my heels can come in and my toe and my knee can go straight out. And then I'll do the opposite of a plie where I put my knees and my toes straight in and my hip joint has to go really wide to be able to do that. Those exercises to get, so you can see my shoulders in here, but this is what I want your hip joint to feel like. That, so that the head of the femur can mobilize in that joint. And then my arm, works as a unit, right? It's not like my upper arm does something and then my forearm does something different. Your arm and your leg move as one. Out of the hip shoulder joint, out of the hip joint. The outward rotation of your leg, how much outward rotation you have will depend on your conformation and your horse's conformation. So there is no ideal in this at all. The more neutral and the looser your hip joint ligaments can be, even a small hipped woman can open up and let the, let the ball joint widen so that the leg can become more elegant on even a wide horse. But that takes a lot of looseness in all of the ligaments in that hip joint to allow the hip joint to widen and drop around you. And that's something to work on all the time so that you can let your leg be elegant and draping. But it's not because you're squeezing it into some artificial position. It's not because you tightened your hip joint, it's because you loosened your hip joint that you can do that. Always it's only correct if the foot alignment is, the foot is in alignment with the knee as in the picture on the left. If they're not the same, you're not effective. You've got tension in there that's impacting your horse in there. So watch that. And forget trying to make your toes straight forward. Let the leg relax and your horse will appreciate it. Um, and the position, okay, ankle supple with the weight in the heel. You, you, the, you, we all know that the heels should be down, um, at least in the neutral, not, maybe not when you're putting your aid on, but in the neutral, when you're taking your leg off, the leg needs to drop down so that the heel comes down. The only reason the heel should come down is because your stirrup is shorter than your leg drops. That's why your heels are down. It's not because you jammed them down there and it's not because you pulled your toe up, that's for damn sure. So forget riding without stirrups with your toe up. Ride without stirrups with your leg, with your angles in extension, an open hip, an open knee, an open ankle. And then put your stirrups on and your heel will be down in the right way when you do that. All right, next. Okay, here. So if you don't believe me that your knee and your toe can go out, here we have Laura Graves and Verdaddy's and her knee and her toe is way out. Okay, so because so many people go, well, I'm not allowed to do that. I'm supposed to have my knee and my toe forward, straight forward. Uh, yeah, you're allowed. That's pretty nice. Think of this is a big horse with a tiny ride. Like she's tall, but she's really, really slim and sl slender hipped. So how does she get around there to impact the horse like that? Now, there are many times when her leg is more straightforward, but that's the neutral place, right? It's not, it's, that's not, she wouldn't have her knee and her toe straight forward and going, well, I wish she'd go sideways in the half pass. She's draped around that horse with her leg by allowing her hip joint, it starts in the hip joint, by allowing that hip joint to open like that. Knee and toe are the same in it. 
She doesn't have the knee out more and the toe more in. She doesn't have the toe out more and the knee in. They're the same. All right. So study that. That's really important. It gives you permission to let your knee and your toe go out so that you're not gripping. All right. And next. Okay. So now the final thing that is really important about riding arm and elbow position. All starts with the pelvis again, all starts with the pelvis. And this is now your elbows need to be tied into your pelvis, into your hip joint all the time. Okay, we've got wrong, wrong, wrong and right. Okay, I have a problem with this. So this is good to a, to a point. And this is what I mean by the book learning, right? Wrong, wrong, this is wrong. She's all grippy. The first one on the left, she's all grippy and her elbows are back and her knees are up and everything's like, you can just see her closing up in the one to the left. Then in the one, the next one, the middle one that's wrong, her hands are way too high. And she's got a good bend in her elbow, but her hands are way too high and they're not going towards the horse's mouth. Then the next one, which I see a lot more often, which is arm straight, you're gonna put your head down horse, <laughs> right? And that's rigid, 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 rigid. And if you get your horse's head down like that, you dare not let go because it's gonna pop up right away. Again, because it's not supple, you're just holding that horse's head down with your hands down there. Then the one that has the check mark, yeah, it's pretty correct. Her leg could be longer. She's still a little too closed up in all of her hip, her hip, knee, and ankle joint is a little too closed. It's not open and draping. But the arm, the shoulder's good and the elbow's good. But look at her hand. We are taught that your hands have to be up here like this with the thumb on, oh, where's the camera? There we go. Thumb on the top with your thumb holding those reins. Nope, nope. This is where I have the problem. This is rigid. Do that with your hands right now and you will go, oh, how nice is that with a metal bit in my mouth, right? The thumb, yeah, it closes, but it's not like this. This is not how you hold your reins. Your reins need to be held here in the palm of your hand and you curl your hand around them. And then you won't have to do this to hold your reins. They'll stay in here. Hey, where's the camera? There, okay? That's where they stay and you curl your hand around it. There's also the curl, super important, super important. Top rider, top rider, top rider, top rider. Four top riders. Look at their hand position. Every one of them, the wrist bends. Sorry, there's the camera. The wrist bends. They can see a little bit of the back of their hand, right? The wrist bends. The wrist bends. It's like a, there's always the hand is curved around the rein. The wrist has to curve. The wrist has to be in flexion. Not flexion like this, but mild flexion. And from there, you can do stuff. Extension, rigid, curled, friendly, right? So these are friendly reins. You can see it's all friendly looking on there. With all of these pictures, you go, oh, well, that looks nice but it's not the position in the slide before for the hand. A little inward rotation. And what I like to say, like I call it a teepee, but it's a roof. Your, with, your hands are a roof over the withers. Withers don't go straight up and down. Withers are slanted. So are your hands. There's a, a quick question as to whether yeah. or not there's any adaption, adaptation to this for uh, just the snaffle only versus nope. with the curb. Same. Absolutely same with the snaffle. It allows you to be effective and stay um, supple at the same time. It allows you to hold the reins in your hands without letting them slip. Now notice like, you know, people say, well, I was always told not to ride with piano hands. These are not piano hands. Piano hands are this with your hands, with your hands open and your hand flat. That's not what I'm talking about. You're still in this curve. And you still have a fist, but it's not like this. It's like that. And then you can do stuff and you can have a conversation with your horse's mouth. So it's totally the same exact thing with a snaffle and, or a double bridle, the same exact thing. That roof over the withers. 
allows you to be supple in your communication with your horse instead of rigid. So that was one of the, you know, one of the things that I don't know, nobody ever taught me this. I learned this all by feel. But when you look back at the books, you go, yeah, I think they're not teaching it quite as like I'd like it taught. So there's a, there's a question. What do you think drove the changes to our understanding of the position? Um, was it, is it our better understanding as a society of biomechanics? Are we? No, I think, what, I think what happened is that this sport was always military with less than sensitive animals. So they, it comes from a cavalry point of view where the military bearing was not necessarily the most supple. Then it came to, now we've got a whole lot of women who like to do this and women like often come with too much arch in their middle of their back. So then you start to learn, okay, now we have to learn how to do a pelvic tilt in there. So I think it's like a progression that way. But I think the thing about the hands comes from a military point of view and we want you to be upright, but we don't want you to be military because it's a moving sport. Does that help? Okay, good. So this pelbo thing. Okay, oh, then, okay. So we call it a pel. I call it a pelbo. I'm telling you, I did not make that up. I, I totally plagiarized that, but I love it. I love it, I love it, I love it because it's so true. The elbow and the pelvis have to be part and parcel. This is great, a visual from the top. There's a triangle from the rider's hips and shoulders to the hands, right? There's a triangle. It's not a square. It's a triangle. That, you can turn your horse without any reins. You can, I'll try this tomorrow, unless they're running away with you because the snow is falling off the roof. You can try this tomorrow. Don't have any reins. Put yourself in that triangle, you know, or have loose reins. And just turn your shoulders and let your triangle turn with you. Your horse will turn. I guarantee you it'll turn. You don't have to get stronger in your outside brain to turn. You just turn. Think about if you were dancing, ballroom dancing, and somebody held your shoulders and said, let's go this way. Let's go this way. You don't do this. Go this way. You just go this way. That it's like part and parcel, this unit, this triangle from above. The more you can keep that, the less you're going to be pulling. You keep that by keeping your elbows with your pelvis. They, keep, they stay with your hips when you turn. And then you have to turn your shoulders like you'd actually like to go to the right instead of, you know, what we see with a lot of people is they'd like to go to the right, but they're always turning left by, with their body. And the horse is going, well, I'd like to turn right, but I can't. So this, that triangle, if you can see that, that visual is really good. It wasn't perfect, but it was good. So here we see the pelbow again. Look at how, okay, hands, obvious, the hand position. But in the first picture on the left, it's in a different phase of the trot, of the stride than the middle picture. But so you can see the pelvis is in the, in the part of the stride, the pelvis is tipped forward in the first picture and the elbow is with it. Middle picture, the pelvis is riding the wave up and the elbow goes with it. The elbow didn't come back. The elbow stayed with the pelvis and the horse can go forward then. And it's not like you threw the reins away and said, just go forward. I don't care if you look like a donkey. You're keeping the contact because your elbow went with your pelvis, not behind it, not in front of it, went with your pelvis. And then the horse can maintain the same connection as it goes forward. So you can, that, you can all see what I'm talking about, right? That's, think about your pelbow tomorrow when you're riding, you'll be better, guaranteed. All right, next stride, next one. Oh, okay. So this is a slow-mo video and this is me on my little almost seven-year-old. And so, cause I, you can, and you can, what you can really see is how everything moves in motion. The, the elbow stays with when I'm absorbing the trot. 
the elbow stays with the pelvis so that she can stay there. And you'll see the reins sometimes get a little bit loose and sometimes help a little bit to keep her back, but there's no pulling back. So see how the elbow drops into the pelvis every stride. Here you can see my leg drop every stride, how the leg drops, it's never rigid. And I think then we get to see her again, the full elbow thing coming up. There, see the elbow going with the pelvis, like now, 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 now. That's allowing the horse to move without throwing her away. So, all right. How, oh my God, we've taken up all the time. That was actually good timing. So the takeaway message, it all starts with your pelvis. Everybody has to do this also. <laughs> it's, the more your pelvis can actually just go with the horse, the more you can impact it. The more you're aware of what your pelvis is doing, the straighter you're going to be. The straighter you're going to be, the more your legs can drop. The more your legs can drop and your elbow can drop, the more effective you're going to be on the horse. So it all starts with the pelvis. And then I thought that at the end, we could just watch that slow motion video of Carl one more time because it's so good. While we're watching it, Dawn, do you want to give me a couple questions if there's any? I don't have too, too many. Uh, I do have a question. Um, the, the, <laughs> the pelbow, where did you play? Where did you plagiarize it from? Who, who came up? It with was it? on the internet. Ah. It was on Facebook. So and I went, that's brilliant. That's exactly what I'm trying to teach. So yeah. Do an investigation on that, track that. Yeah. All right. We're getting lots of thank yous in the chat. This is this has awesome. been riveting. I don't think any of us realized we were where we were at with the clock. <laughs> I know, I know. Good. Me neither. That is awesome. So just enjoy, Carl. And then, you know, like watching stuff like this before you ride will make you ride better. Try, uh, and that's a big thing. Don't watch bad dressage. It, it impacts you. Whatever you're watching impacts you. Watch, if you get, think about preparing yourself to get on a horse, watch this for three minutes, invest in that, and it's gonna impact your ride in a positive way. I do have, there is there are some questions around um, uh, like spinal injuries for people, not for horses, although that, you know. Yeah. Also, are there particular exercises to help maintain suppleness in uh, a balance, but you mentioned the sun salutations earlier, a couple of other things. Are there any other exercises you wanna particularly call out? Well, there's a whole bunch, there are a whole bunch. The more stretching that you can do, runner stretch, be, running is bad for riding. Walking is good for riding. Running is bad for riding. It tightens your hip flexors up. So uh, any of the runner stretches, because runners have to do those stretches, any of those will help you. Um, when you walk, so I walk out from my barn to my house to the barn in the morning. When I walk, I walk, I try to do a model walk, like really making the hip joint open. And when I walk, I push away the back foot so that I push the hip forward and I can feel the stretch in my hip joint and I can feel my SI getting looser. Just in that walk, I'm better getting on the horse. I don't, of course, I'm not a physiotherapist. I'm not that, I can't really talk to specific injuries but I know what works to loosen your hip joint and you have to then work within a specialist to help you with those kind of things. But those still, it's still really, I mean, it's really important. I was at the para, coaching at the Paralympics this year in Tokyo and the, the ones who were winning at each level were still able, were still focusing on those things to ride their horses really, really, really well at each level of the para. So we, you know, and they're overcoming injuries that are quite significant, some of them. So yeah. I, it's still the same concept. We do have an ask, uh, Beth, I don't know if we're able to uh, go back to that first image where you point out where exactly uh, you wanted that movement from the low back. Oh, uh, that gif, that gif is good. Yeah. Yeah.
We have to go way back. <laughs> We're going through the whole thing really fast. There, it just went forward. One forward from there, there, this gif, right? Yeah. Yeah. So there's no downward in that movement. There's no downward. There is a following the curve of the saddle in the motion. If your bum's loose, you can do that. You cannot do this with your glutes. So I see way too many people trying to do this with their glutes pushing their pelvis, which is wrong. Keep you try to keep those glutes loose and let your sweep your pelvis through it. So it's all those internal muscles up a little bit higher than your glutes that are going to help you do this. Thank you very much, Shannon. This, this all of this, everyone's blown away in the chat. I think we're going to be rewatching this one for a while. That's awesome. I must say, Shannon, thank you so much. I think we're all going to be sleeping tonight in slow motion. Moving back and forth. <laughs> Good. And then don't forget to make your horses forward from your leg. <laughs> Absolutely. We'll be doing this. Shannon, thank you so much. And thank you everybody for being with us tonight. And thank and you to uh, Beth for putting it together. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Right. And we will see you all next week. Shannon, thanks again. Always all right. fabulous. All right. Great. Thanks. Have a good night, everybody. Okay, bye.